What's up? That's what they say, right? Fans, that's what young people say? Yes? Do I sound young and really cool right now? Because you are hip as fair. Man, this, <laughs> this lecture is going to be on the fleek. No. I'm just joking. <laughs> I, send me some cool words I can incorporate into my vernacular later. Lit. Oh, I know about lit. Listen, I've been to Robley. I know about that. I don't even know what that means, but okay. Um, just figure if you mention Robley, people like will read their own interpretation into it. Uh, hey, so I wanted to thank you guys. Like, uh, you know, it's the day before a break, and I know people. Some people don't come to class, and so <laughs> I'm, I was kind of scared there was going to be like. Two of us here today, so thanks for showing up. I guess um, this must, there must be some sort of Stockholm syndrome where you guys are like, "Well, I hate the class, but I have to go." He makes me. I'm just. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here. Um, we're gonna do some more graph stuff today. An assignment goes up today, and I know you. You guys might not actually be caught up. I mean, I just gave you one a week ago. Um, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Bad news. Bad news. Bad? Wow, okay. The bad news is there's, there's still plenty of work to do. There's going to be an eighth homework, and there's a final, and so there's, there's lots left to do. So then the good news is that homework seven that goes out today is only just one part. You know, these assignments always are like two parts, three parts, ten parts, whatever. This one's only got one part. I know, I'm so nice. I must really love you guys. I, just, I know you just had an assignment last week, so. Uh, no, it's not that big of a part. It's anyway. Uh, this one's not probably not quite as many hours as some of the other assignments, but partly that's because I want to still give you like frankly assignment eight is sort of kind of like part two of, of assignment seven in terms of they both have a graph component to them. Uh, in another world, I potentially could have assigned them both today. I, I'll probably post assignment eight a little ahead of that just so it's out. Uh, but anyway, and, and I know this assignment seven that's going to go up is going to be out during the break. And I think I said this last lecture that I don't honestly expect you to work on stuff during the break, really. I mean, if you're not done with assignment six, you can finish it up or whatever. But like, I don't expect you to work on seven while you're eating your Thanksgiving turkey. I would expect you to maybe wait till you come back or something. It's up to you, though. Uh, was there a question? Yeah. The final is on Monday or Tuesday? The final, I believe, is mm, Monday. Oh, so this should say the 11th? Uh, I don't have the schedule in front of me. Uh, let me double check that later. I just don't want to. I don't want to lose class time on that. But I thought it was yeah. Monday, but maybe that's say the eleventh. Then is that what that should say? Yeah. I'll double check it. It's on the um, whatever it says on access and stuff is is right. Uh, maybe it's actually up here under exams. Eleventh. Uh, yeah. So I just need to fix the lecture calendar page. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Question. Uh, is assignment eight going to be due like on the final day or before then? Or? Assignment eight is going to be out here and then due here. And then the final's going to be down here. It's not pictured on the calendar next Monday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's where we're at. That's what we're doing. Um, I want to cover, jump right into to graph stuff now. So we learned an algorithm called uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. Can you just quickly describe to me what's the difference between Dijkstra and some of the other ones that we learned so far? Like, what does Dijkstra give you that the other ones don't in terms of its results? Yeah. The lowest cost, lowest weight path, as opposed to the shortest length path, like read first searched, right? OK, cool. Uh, what's the sort of very quick version of how it accomplishes that? Um, how do you find the minimum weight path? How does it differ from the other algorithms in terms of how it finds? Yeah. It uses a priority queue and sorts the different paths by cost. So it just goes along the least expensive paths until one path finds it. Yeah, that's a great summary. It uses a priority queue sorted by cost. So it looks at the cheapest cost first, and so it finds the shortest cost. Lowest cost path first, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> so that's Dijkstra's <laughs> algorithm. And uh, today, what I want to start with is I want to talk about a variation of Dijkstra's algorithm called A star search. And um, I like this algorithm a lot. I learned it when I was a student, and I used it to implement a game I was building. And uh, I always thought it was neat ever since then. And so uh, this algorithm is a lot like Dijkstra, but it's got a specific optimization that I want to teach you about. So OK. <laughs> I want to think about context. I want to think about how some graphs might have extra information that we haven't been thinking about so far. So imagine that the graph represents a game world or a maze or something like that. And so I'm going to draw it as like a two-dimensional grid of squares, but I want you to think of it as a graph where every square is a vertex and the edges 
points are exist if there's a path, if you can walk from the vertex to the next one. But like this guy has a wall next to him, so there's no edge to that direction. So I can't go over there or even over there. I just, I can go down or up or right from that square. Got it? So it's a graph. So imagine I'm trying to find a path from this starting point A to this ending point C. Now, if you were using like a depth first search, you would just pick a direction and start walking around and then maybe eventually you'd find the goal or something like that, right? But you might not find the shortest path. If you're using a breadth first search, you would sort of conceptually speaking, you just sort of fan out by one over and over and over until you found it, right? And you would actually find the shortest path that way, right? Because that's what breadth first search does and it finds the shortest path, so that's good. Dijkstra's algorithm. What would happen if you ran Dijkstra's algorithm on this graph? Sort by cost, minimum cost, path. What would it do? Does it not work? I mean, Dijkstra's algorithm is all about cost or weight. This isn't really a weighted graph. What would it do on an unweighted graph? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mentioned a long time ago that if you have an unweighted graph, you can kind of pretend that all the edges have weight of one, equal weight, or zero, or whatever. And so if you ran Dijkstra, it would use a PQ, but the PQ sorting wouldn't be very interesting because they all have a tie. So it would just kind of sort them, it would just it would sort them by the order you added them or whatever, or maybe an alphabetical order or something. And so essentially what I'm trying to say is that Dijkstra would basically do the same thing as breadth first search. It would just fan out because all the paths have a cost of one, so it would try them all in that order. So yeah, in an unweighted graph, Dijkstra's algorithm devolves into breadth-first search. Okay, And actually, if you just think about that for a second, that makes sense because in a graph where all the edges have weight 1, the minimum weight path, by definition, is the minimum length path. right? Because weight and length are directly proportional to each other. Okay, so that's what Dijkstra does. Now, I raise another question. What should Dijkstra's algorithm do? Well, I mean, you know, if we were trying to be smart here, remember what Dijkstra and Breadth for a Search are going to do is they're going to fan out in all of these directions by one equally until eventually they find a path to here. Do you have any intuitions about this graph or this problem that might be better than that algorithm? Yeah, you're right. Maybe sort by like 50, 50 or Yeah, I think our intuition here is like, I want to go that way. <laughs> I want to go to the right. I, at least, I mean, if I know that like A has coordinates one, uh, four, or whatever, and this has coordinates five, comma, whatever the coordinates are, like, if I know I'm going east eventually, my destination lies to the east. Like, it might be that I have to go way over there to find a path around to get to the destination. But it would be better if it were that way. If I could just walk there, or if I could mostly walk there and then move out of the way a little. So. Why don't I try going to the right more than I try going to the left? I might need to look to the left eventually or, or somewhat, but all things being equal, if I'm trying to fan out all these ways, why don't I go this way a little more before I go that way, and then this way a little more before I go that way? You understand what I'm saying? So let's take advantage of things we know about the spatial relationships of the edges and the nodes in the graphs and stuff. That's the intuition here. So here's an observation. Dijkstra's algorithm uses a priority queue based on what we know so far. The idea of Dijkstra, I showed an animation of slides of Dijkstra where we had visited a certain set of vertexes. They were green. We also had enqueued a certain set of vertexes. They were yellow. And so the visited ones we know everything about. We know the cheapest cost to reach them. That's why we have visited them. Once we have visited and pulled something out of the PQ and marked it as green, that's the cheapest you can ever get to that vertex. We're sure of that. These yellow ones that are still in the PQ that have not been pulled out yet, those ones we know a little bit about. And then there's ones that we haven't even looked at yet that we know nothing about. So like Dijkstra's mm -hmm. algorithm is based on what we know so far about how to get from the start to a midpoint. But we might be able to infer something about what would be more likely to happen to get from that midpoint to the final point. And that goes back to this slide back here. It's like, if I get from the start to here, let's say, this square, versus if I get from the start to here, this square, I could say, well, maybe the paths to those two places are pretty similar costs as each other, from starting from A. But 
I like being here better than I like being here, just because it's here is closer to the goal. So if you know something about the locations of these things, you might, if you knew something about an estimate of how far this might take to get from the midpoint to the goal, maybe we could incorporate that into the algorithm, okay? The only tricky part, though, is like, you're not sure. Like, I mean, if you look at a graph like this, if I look at this square right here, I go, oh, you know, that square is only two away from the target. That's a good square. But actually, he's got walls, so you can't just go two. You can go all the way around. And actually, you could imagine that there's walls like this, so that like going this way is totally not even helpful. You know what I mean? So I think he's good, but he might not actually be good. So it's a, it's a, you could have an instinct or a guess about how good a path is or a direction is or a vertex is, but you're not certain of that, you know? Okay, so let's explore the sort of unknown distance and what we could say about it. Uh, this is Dijkstra. Again, if you're thinking of a 2D spatial graph, it goes out by one, by two, by three, by four, and these are the costs to reach all these squares, right? Okay, and we want to go that way. So the paths over here are in the wrong direction. The algorithm doesn't really understand that. The algorithm doesn't consider that at all. So what if we could give the algorithm a hint? So let's talk about something called a heuristic. A heuristic is just a fancy word. It just means like a estimation, an educated guess, approximation. <clears throat> so um, an example of a heuristic is uh, when email <laughs> comes into your inbox, a set of code looks at the email and gives it a spammy score. How spammy is this message? And the score is based on several things. It's based on like, you know, how many people was it sent to? Who is it sent from? Uh, what is the content of the message? What's the subject of the message? All these other things, right? And based on all that, they give it some kind of score where we think this message is uh, 11.6 on the spamminess scale. <laughs> and if it's over a certain threshold, we put it in your spam folder. Now, you guys probably know a spam folder isn't perfect. Maybe every so often you go look in there and there's a real message that shouldn't have been put in there, but mostly it's right. So it's estimated, it's educated guess. It's often correct, but not always. That's a spamming heuristic, or it's sometimes called a Bayesian filter. But, okay, so in the context of a graph, if we could estimate how good a midpoint is in terms of getting to a destination, that would be like a heuristic. There's a certain category of heuristics that uh, I'll call admissible heuristics. And those are heuristics that are less than or equal to the actual answer. So basically they're over eager. And uh, I mentioned this on purpose because it's important to the algorithm that I'm going to teach you. Um, so an example of an admissible heuristic, if I go back to this map, if I'm asking about these different <coughs> vertexes like this one or that one or whatever, and I'm trying to figure out how good is this vertex? Do I like it? Do I like it in terms of getting from here to here? An admissible heuristic might be the distance from here to here directly, like maybe just the straight line distance from one to the other. This one has a straight line distance of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This one has a distance of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So maybe this one's 7, that one's 11. I like the 7 one better in terms of priority queue or something like that. Um, but again, that's an underestimate. It's an optimistic guess. The right answer is either my guess or worse. Maybe there's a wall and I have to go around or something. So an optimistic guess that's definitely going to be less than or equal to the truth is called an admissible heuristic. And in the context of the algorithm I'm going to teach you today, it's important to be able to think of an admissible heuristic. Yeah. So, so, so in this algorithm, uh, are the heuristics, do they always like concern distance? No. Um, I think this is the most accessible example. Um, so like, uh, I, I think students really get like spatial examples like this, because it's like, oh, this vertex is better because it's closer to there. But like, imagine I'm looking for word ladders yeah. between two words, and like, you guys try all the different, you did the bread first search, right? So you could do something like, well, if I change this letter to that letter, that's one possible path. And if I change this letter to that letter, that's a possible path. Which one's better? Well, if I look at both of those possibilities, this one has fewer letters different from the destination word. I'm not positive I can get from this to the destination word, but I like that start because it seems like it's closer to the destination. So maybe in a word ladder example, the number of letters that differ would be a heuristic. Uh, so, so, of, the case, so the case of an unmissable heuristic would be the for distance in that case? 
Well, you could just use what's called the edit distance of what's like number of characters that are wrong, basically. You could just add that up and say, the, the minimum number of changes and hops I'd have to make from here to get to the target would be that. That's if every single one of the intermediate states is a valid English word. And therefore, I can't get to the destination any faster than that. But it might take me more than that. So that would be an example of it. It's a missable heuristic, basically. But yeah, anyway, the spatial ones are the easiest ones, I think, to, to just kind of picture. You know? OK, so, so I just want to be really clear here. Not every graph has like a heuristic for the vertexes. Some do, because the graph represents something that we have other information about. Like this is a graph about a maze or a map or a word ladder. And so I know something about these intermediate states that I can use in my reasoning. But just some random graph that I just give you with nodes and edges may or may not have such a heuristic. Okay? Um, so the algorithm I'm teaching you is called A star. It's a modified version of Dijkstra. And really, the only change you make is that when you're making this PQ, remember that the PQ stores vertexes based on the cost to reach the vertex? The only change you make is you add in a heuristic. It's the cost to reach a vertex plus a heuristic of how good I think the vertex <coughs> is. You add those together, that becomes the PQ score for that node. And that adjusts the sorting order of the PQ a little bit. And adjusting the sorting order of the PQ adjusts the order in which you check out the paths and visit the paths. And that will cause the algorithm to run faster on certain graphs. So in, t in terms of looking for a path from A to C, the vertexes B are the ones that are in the PQ. And it has not only the cost to reach it, which is known exactly from Dijkstra, but it also has the estimated heuristic of how much it might cost from here to reach the goal. We add these together. That forms the priority of the, um, of the element that you added. Okay? So let me try to show you an example. So this, uh, back to this graph right here. Um, we already kind of talked about this. I mean, the, the cost of something in the PQ is literally just the number of steps it took us to reach it. The heuristic is going to be the direct distance to the goal, ignoring any walls. So something like this. This would be a heuristic for this particular type of graph. Every square, I don't need any context. Just I can just tell you a score. This score, this guy has a heuristic score of one because he's one square away. This one has two, this one has three, four, five. But you'll notice like, Again, like you cannot get there in three pops because there's walls in the way. But in a perfect world, that would be the score, right? So that's a heuristic for these guys. Um, so when you, uh, this, this is the pseudocode of Dijkstra's algorithm. It's a little bit of a blob, but basically pull things out of a PQ and use the cost to put the neighbors in. That's the idea. This is in gray because that's Dijkstra. A star is the exact same code, but Oops, oh, it's a different font size. Oh, that sucks. Wait, it doesn't look as good if it's not the same font. Uh, it, I thought it had the same font. How about that? Does that work? <laughs> Come on, man. It's so close, but look down here. It like moves a little bit. Oh, well, that's OK. Um, so like, here's Dijkstra. A star. Dijkstra. A star. <laughs> um, the blue parts are the new parts. Just instead of storing things with just the cost to reach them so far, which is what Dijkstra does, you store them in the PQ by cost to reach them so far plus their magical heuristic score from the midpoint to the goal. That's it. That you just you just patch the algorithm to contain that extra information. So I mean, it doesn't seem like a very big change to the algorithm. Does it make a big change in the behavior? It, well, it sure can. Um, so, oh gosh, do I actually want to walk through this example? Um, here, let me do something different. I want to run, like the homework seven that you guys have to do is this trailblazer thing. And uh, I'll just run the, de I think this, this is the best example I can show you. So here's a map of San Francisco. I don't know, I don't go to San Francisco, so I guess this is what San Francisco looks like. Uh, it's got a lot of vertexes. Actually, maybe I won't start with this one. Maybe I'll do, um, Maybe I'll do this map of Stanford. This one's kind of cool. Here's Stanford. I don't go to Stanford very much either. So <laughs> I think this is the quad. Uh, yeah, where are we? Uh, we're somewhere around here. Yeah, we're in here somewhere, right? But anyway, um, oh no, it's on fire. Ah! <laughs> yeah, California fire is out of control. Um, 
So like if you click on vertexes, it starts doing the algorithm, right? So like if I click here and then I click here, it starts fanning out. Now it's a little hard to see, but like <coughs> it's going this way and it's going this way, you know, and it's kind of exploring both. And that's cool. If I change the algorithm to A star, oh, and, and, it, and it has to visit a total of 576 vertexes. So if I switch it to A star and I run the same algorithm, it visits 48 vertexes. <laughs> because basically, I, it like, it has the choice of going this way or this way, and it's like, wait, the goal is over here, so why don't I mostly go that way? Now if you have a sharp eye, you'll notice it does a little bit go in the other directions. It doesn't entirely go the right way. It goes a little bit off the path, but it tries to minimize that because it doesn't want to. It thinks I, I'd like to go toward the goal if I can. Uh, maybe another example, I can do it with these mazes too. Uh, where's a maze? Large. Here's a maze. You guys played with mazes before. So if I use Dijkstra's algorithm to go from, let's say, here to here, it sort of spreads evenly. Now, it, um, this is an unweighted graph. So that Dijkstra run was essentially a, binary, a, a, a breadth first search. So it just sort of fans out. It might not have looked like it fanned out radially, but that was it fanning out in each path that it could follow radially. And it looked at 1,700 squares. But the A star is going to say, hey, I'm starting here, and I want to go over there. So kind of if I can go to the right, I want to look at that maybe a little more than left. If I can go down, I want to do that a little more than up. So if I do it with A star, instead of looking at 1,798 squares, it looks at 849. So now I can run it again a little slower. Like you might say, wait, that didn't look that cool. Like, it's kind of going the wrong way here. What's going on? I thought you said it was going to go that way. Well, there's no way to go that way right now. So it's kind of, it's picking what it can. But look, do you see how it's going right now? It's going right a lot. As long as it can go right, it will. So if it finds a way to go right, it's really going to take it. So I don't know. It's kind of hard to see that from this example. Let me see if I can find a different example. Um, let me look at maze 7. Oops. Stop. Go. Maze 7. Load. Okay, how about this one? I'm gonna go from here to here. Uh, <laughs> animation would help. Let me try again. Oops. Do you see how it like wants to go kind of toward it? it? If you watch it carefully, it'll go like a little bit away from it. If you watch these bad paths, like every end times it'll do one of these. <laughs> And so it's kind of trying. Do you see how it really wanted to go that way? Because it's like, I think I'm almost there, almost there. Oh, you know. It like really wanted to go that way, but that one didn't work out. And now it's kind of liking this. This is the minimum. I'll see there it goes. It likes that path. So the algorithm really like leans toward the goal. You can just see it do that. And it visits 591 squares. And with the Dijkstra, it doesn't lean in that way at all. So you're going to see a lot more stuff up here and down here, I think. And so let's see how long how what Dijkstra does. Let's speed it up a little. So it's just much more just spreading out evenly. Uh, and it takes, it looks at 1400 versus 591. So you can see, like, it makes a big improvement to use this A star algorithm. Yeah. Um, since with A star search, we're like stopping at like the first path. We're not guaranteed the shortest path, right? Um, we're, oh, are we guaranteed to have the shortest path? Uh, well, in this case, these are unweighted graphs. And in an unweighted graph, Dijkstra and A star both will find the shortest path. But in a weighted graph, uh, Dijkstra and A-star might want to go out of their way to do a longer path if it's cheaper. Uh, and actually, I think uh, there's different types of graphs that this program will work with. If you load up these terrain graphs, these are kind of interesting. The terrain maps are, uh, it's a little hard to understand because it looks like a gray blob. That's like before I got my LASIK, everything looked like that basically. But um, <laughs> um, this is meant to be an overhead uh, terrain map. Like if you look down from the space or from a sky or something, the lighter color is like a higher elevation, like top of a hill or mountain or something, and the darker color is like a little valley or a ravine or something. And so the idea of this graph is that you can't really see the vertexes because like every little square is a vertex. And they're all neighbors of the ones next to them, all eight directions. So there's no real like walls here, but it's more expensive of an edge to go uphill. So like if you're down in the dark here, you're going that way up to the top of this, those edges are costing you a little bit more. So I think the idea here would be like, if I want to get from here to here, 
The most direct path between these two would be right over this mountain, but I have to climb up the mountain and go over it and go down. But maybe I'm gonna go around the mountain a little bit. And so if I use, um, if I use like breadth first search to go from here to here, let's say here, it'll just fan out like equally because it's breadth first. It's exactly what it would do, right? It would just fan out. It's gonna take a minute. <laughs> go on breadth first, you can do it. Oh man, I'm just gonna turn the delay off. There. <laughs> now, you might say, wait, what? That's not the shortest. The, the, don't worry about that. That doesn't look right. But basically, a diagonal counts as one, just the same as a straight line counts as one. So actually, wiggling <coughs> diagonal is not, even though that doesn't look right, that's okay. That's a minimum uh, length path. But it, it goes right over the mountain, basically. So uh, if I use Dijkstra's algorithm, you'll see. Whoa, that was too fast. Uh, let me try again. Dijkstra's algorithm, it fans out. I love it because it looks like you're pouring liquid on the map or something, doesn't it? It kind of just spreads, and it tends to spread in the low parts. Now you'll see it kind of doesn't want to go up the hill. You see that? Because like that's expensive, so it kind of doesn't like going that way. So it's kind of flowing around these dark parts before. Now this is not a star, so it's not trying to go down to get here. It's just trying to avoid going up hills if it can avoid it. Okay, it's trying to avoid expensive edges. So it'll fan out. It will go a little more dark than light. It'll eventually find the minimum weight path. My guess is rather than going this way like before, it'll probably go kind of around the mountain over here. You might find it'll cut through. At some point, it'll decide it's worth cutting through the mountain a little bit, but it'll probably go more like this, I would guess. Let's find out. <laughs> Wait for it. Yeah, so it went through the mountain a little bit, but it kind of avoided the most like hottest, whitest part of the mountain here. Now, okay, and it had to look at 11,000 vertexes to do that. Uh, let's look at A star. Now, again, what you're going to see now, unlike Dijkstra, which kind of fanned out radially, you're going to really see it want to go like down toward the goal, I think. So let's try that. So I slowed it down a little bit. Look at what it's doing. The liquid's still pouring out in the low edges, but it's not going up very much. It's wanting to go down more. It's a little hard to see, but um, if I speed it up a little, Look at how much it's wanting to go down, and it's not really spreading up and right like over here as much. It's much more going down. Now look, it is going up there a little. It does go up there some, you know, because like at some point, it's better to go up there than not. So it found the same path, the same uh, cost path, but it looked at, you know, 4,000 instead of uh, 11,000 vertexes. Yeah. So is heuristic usually considered more directional and like what happens when Right, so I mean, I'm gonna wave my hands a little bit about it, but basically, as long as you have an admissible heuristic, it won't break anything. I mean, the, the main thing we have to watch out for is if we think we're doing some clever optimization, but then we don't actually find the minimum weight path, then that's not okay. Like, the whole point here is to find the minimum weight path, and I could just go straight down, but that's not the minimum weight. So there's optimizations that would break this, right? And the whole idea of an admissible heuristic is that if your estimation is less than or equal to the right answer, then it means that it won't break your PQ. If you estimated something that was worse than the right answer, then it would cause a good path to go late in the PQ. And then you wouldn't look at it. And that would be very damaging to your algorithm because there might be a better path that you didn't bother to look at. But because we have these aggressive estimations of the goal by just going straight to the goal, that will sort the PQ in such a way that we don't look at somebody uh, out of order, basically. It's okay. So, I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's the instinct. That's the intuition about it. Now, you also said something else, which was like, so are these heuristics basically spatial, like go that way? And uh, his question was about like same, same kind of thing. And I gave him an example of like word ladders. If I was searching in a graph to find a word ladder, you could choose to go to a neighboring word that was more similar to the destination word. Like, for example, I'm turning from, you know, cat into dog. So I could turn cat into caught, caught with an O. That's closer to being dog because it has a letter in common with dog, right? Or I could turn cat into rat. That's still got three letters different from dog. So you might try caught before you try rat because heuristically, it's, in theory, it might be possible to turn caught into dog in two moves. Whereas I know that rat must need at least three moves to turn into dog, right? So like that would be a heuristic for word ladder graph search. And you know it's admissible because 
it's, it's not possible that my estimate is going to be um, bigger than the right answer. If, if I have caught and I want dog, I know I need at least two more moves. So my heuristic is two, so the, the, the right answer can't possibly... Uh, so it's like a, like a similarity distance. Yeah, I would say so. It, yeah, some kind of score of like how good... If you have a way to, to accurately approximate how much better this one is relative to the right answer, that's what you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I can give you an answer that will really satisfy you. Like, it basically, so I think what you're saying is like, maybe I put them, because of my heuristics, you're worried that maybe my, my heuristic is too good, so it goes too early in the PQ, right? So, I mean, I think the best instinct I can give you is like, it will cause you to look at somebody early. That, that would cause you to look at somebody too early, right? But like, the case where like, let's say you're, uh, Right. Well, I mean, I, I don't think I have a good slide to like, I think visually it would be easier to illustrate. But basically what will happen is you might cause, that might cause you to go down a path that's not going to be the right answer. Yeah. But before you get all the way to the goal, like you'll get closer to the goal, but then you'll discover, oops, there's some expensive edges I didn't account for. And those expensive edges will raise the pre-heuristic cost of where you have gotten to. And that will cause where you have gotten to to go later in the PQ. And so just from the math of it all, It'll cause you to go a little bit down the wrong path, but it won't cause you to completely go down the wrong path. And so like you'll get close to the wrong answer, but then you'll stop because the, the numbers will catch up to you. And now your PQ vertex will go push later, and the right one will bubble up ahead of you now. And so I mean, I don't think I have a way to visually just show you that, but like it, it works itself out short of breaking the algorithm is kind of the way I want to say it. Do you have a, a comment? Do you think of like Dijkstra as like a star where like the heuristic is just always Sure, that's fine. That's totally a reasonable way to think of it. Dijkstra is a star with a heuristic of everybody has a zero heuristic. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but if I were implementing code for algorithms, that might be a good way to avoid redundancy between two algorithms. Yes. Uh, another comment, yeah. Do you have an example of a graph where a star does worse than Dijkstra? Do I have an example of a graph where a star does worse? No, so by definition, it cannot do worse. If it does, it's broken. So if A star would do worse, it means your heuristic function is wrong. And therefore, you shouldn't use A star. <laughs> or like your graph does not have a heuristic. So like, I'll just show you on that trailblazer program that we had. It, it works to run A star here because we have these heuristics about height. It also works to run A star on like this map of uh, San Francisco or whatever because uh, I can use the straight line distance from here to here as my like heuristic of whether to go that way or not. But then I have some other maps, like uh, I have this map of Middle Earth. And the map of Middle Earth, the edges here are not based on like x, y coordinate distance. That one's 30 and that one's 50. That's a really long edge, but it's 15. Professor Eric Roberts made these edge weights based on how dangerous he thought those paths were in actual Middle Earth, according to his reading of the source material. So <laughs> the weighting, he's great. You should get to know him. Um, <coughs> the weighting is based on something non-spatial. And there's no particular intuitions about those weights. Like, just because I get to, like, Isengard isn't the bad place to be. They're taking the hobbits to Isengard. That's a good place to be. If you don't know that song, Google it. There's, ten, there's a 10 hour version of the song. Um, <laughs> there's no way you can intuit how good it is to be. Sure, you might say, I want to go that way or something, but the edge, you have no sense from where you are how, how uh, weighty the edges are going to be around you. So this particular graph, uh, in the info of the graph, I have the heuristic function disabled. So therefore, if you run a star on this, you'll just get the same result as uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. 
just because this graph, I cannot come up with any heuristic that really works. So you asked me, like, what about a star? What if it breaks the graph? Basically, if it would, you shouldn't use a heuristic function, and you should basically not have a star differentiate itself from Dijkstra. So it always necessarily visits less nodes than Dijkstra? It would potentially visit the same nodes as Dijkstra if the heuristic were zero. Um, but if you tried to apply this, like basically, look, if you took x, y distance as a heuristic here, and you ran a star using that heuristic, a star would give you incorrect path. And so I don't want to do that. Yes. So uh, if you ran this with no heuristic, a star would just do what Dijkstra does, which is what you said. So it won't examine fewer nodes than Dijkstra will. It will do exactly what Dijkstra does, and just it'll it'll just find the same path Dijkstra did. And if where it makes sense to have a heuristic, like a maze. Uh, my question is basically, can you make a maze where you kind of wave the stack so that it's always a, it, it seems like you really want to go to the right, but you don't really, and so a star will take longer than? Oh, can that? you make it so that a star will do the worse thing? Like, is it always strictly like faster or equal to that star? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think the answer is like, if I, if I made a maze that had like, okay, how do I draw? Um, Don't read that. Uh, if I if I made a maze that was like uh, this, and I start here, <laughs> and I want to go over here, and like you're in a path like that or something, right? There. Do you like this maze? It's a great maze. Uh, <laughs> there. All right. I think we're done here. <laughs> so like, a star might want to go that way more, right? And so imagine imagine that I stretch this mid part so it's really long, and like, oops, I go way far down this wrong path. So I could imagine a star would go looking that way more, which could be a bad thing. I think the, the main thing, though, is that the path it finds will still be minimum yeah. like, weight path. So it won't find a worse path. I think it's probably true. I haven't thought about it lately. But I think it's probably true that a star might look at more vertexes in an example like this that's kind of skewed to harm a star. But I think part of the goal of a star is like, if you look at a lot of the kinds of graphs that we're dealing with, you're unlikely to end up in such a ludicrous like situation. And so you're relying on the graph to be unlikely to fall in. Like you'd have to really carefully construct a graph to make A star worse, you know? It's so much better over the span of all graphs you're likely to see. Yeah. In this example, wouldn't Dijkstra also necessarily have to go through that correct path? Yeah, I think Dijkstra would go all these directions. So I think Dijkstra would get over here at some point. Like so, any, like, I don't, it doesn't seem like you can make a maze to trick A star because any path that the an invisible heuristic of A star would search, it seems like that star would also search that before searching the correct path. Yeah, I think that might be right. I haven't thought about if it's true that you never see more vertexes with A star. I, I don't know, like an adversarial graph today, but I understand what you're saying. Like in this example, I think Dijkstra would actually eventually check that whole this wrong path to the right. So I think my example doesn't break Dijkstra yet. So I have to think about it a little bit more, though. Did you have a comment on that? I can't think of an example that maybe the Wittrick A star can kind of maybe go back and forth, getting closer and closer to the goal, because then no matter what, it's going to try and go back down because it's a little closer and a little closer, but then the actual path is going down. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we table it. Like, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. I, I'd have to like uh, try to craft some wicked graphs and see if I can beat it. I mean, I think the main thing, though, is that you're not going to get a worse path through A star. As long as you have a graph that has a valid heuristic, you're going to be OK. It's not going to make you return a worse result. That's important. So OK, um, that's A star. Now, um, I want to show you another thing before we run out of time here today. Oh, wait, where is it? Um, where is it? This one. I want to talk about a, a completely different type of graph algorithm for a minute called spanning trees. And that's probably all we'll have time for today. And I'll do more of it next Monday after break. But Spanning trees is the last thing we need for the homework assignment. So uh, I want to teach you about what is a minimum spanning tree. And I want to teach you about an algorithm for finding them, which is called Kruskal's algorithm. So uh, <clears throat> here's a particular application for motivation. Suppose we have a maze. And a maze is a grid of, square, a grid of squares, you know, two-dimensional uh, set of squares on the screen. And we have vertexes that are like little, little squares in the maze. And we have edges between them if there's no wall blocking them. So these are like. This isn't the maze because there's no walls, basically. But if you put some walls up by like snipping some of these edges, you would conceptually have a maze. So what if I want to like generate random mazes? Well, you know, I want that basically. Like if I if I snip 
an edge like here, I have essentially created a wall here, right? Now you guys already learned about this several weeks ago, and I was tricking you because I was basically giving you a graph problem without telling you that, and that's the <coughs> kind of a-hole that I am. I like to force you to do homework seven material way before homework seven. Um, so, <laughs> Basically, what a one way to generate a maze would be if you thought of the maze as a graph and tried to generate what's called a spanning tree of the graph. A spanning tree is when you take a graph and you subset its edges so that all the vertexes are connected in the graph, but there aren't any cycles. You remember, cycle is where you wrap around and get back where you started. So if there are no cycles at all, you have a spanning tree. So like here's an example of a spanning, sorry, animation doesn't work very well, but here's a spanning tree for that left graph. I just snipped some of the edges out. This graph here, everybody's connected to everybody. You can reach everybody, but there's no <coughs> loops and cycles. You can't, you can't get back where you started uh, in this graph, right? What is this called complete? Uh, well, a complete, a connected graph is a graph that everybody can reach everybody. That's what this is. A complete graph is literally, there's a direct edge from everyone to everyone. So anyway, uh, that's what a spanning tree is. A maze is kind of a spanning tree of the 2D graph. If you snip out a bunch of edges, I mean, it would be fine to have a maze that did have cycles, but like if you snip out edges until you have a spanning tree, that does make a nice maze. It's a good way to generate a random maze. So, okay, that's what a spanning tree is. A variety of a spanning tree is called a minimum spanning tree. That is such a spanning tree where you have the lowest total combined weight of all the edges in the tree that's possible to have. So um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> my, my picture is not very helpful because I think I should change this picture, but basically the idea would be, see how I, I snipped out certain edges to get this spanning tree, but I could have kept D instead of E, right? You see that? I could have kept D and removed E. That would also have been a spanning tree. So are they equally good? Well, the idea would be that if D had a lower weight than E, I should have kept D. You kind of keep the cheapest ones that you can while still having everybody be connected. If you do that all the way through, that's called a minimum spanning tree. Technically speaking, it's a spanning tree for which there's no other spanning tree available for that graph that has a lower sum of weights than it. Okay? So again, my picture sucks because I don't have weights written on the edges, but I think... Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going to skip this slide too. Okay, so uh, I, I want to get to a different example of it. Like, so there are several examples, several algorithms you can use to find spanning trees in a graph. The one I want to teach you guys is called Kruskal's algorithm. It's fairly straightforward, and you learned about it in the homework assignment a few weeks ago, where you, uh, you take all the edges out of the graph, you put them into a priority queue based on cost, and then while the PQ isn't empty, you pull an edge out, and if the endpoints of that edge are not connected to each other yet, you put the edge back into the graph. That's basically what you did with these clusters in your homework assignment, right? You unite the clusters of vertexes of, of things. So that's what this algorithm is, basically. So um, here's a graph. Uh, you know, I'm just, it's that same algorithm, but written in a more graphy kind of way, right? So now what I've got here is all the edges have names and then they have edge costs and weights associated with them, right? So if I take all the edges here and I throw them into a PQ, which edge is the algorithm going to look at first? A, right? Okay, so let's just, let's just do it together. So there's the PQ, right? So we pull A out of the PQ. Do I want to keep A in the graph? Yeah. yeah, okay, let's keep it. We got A, so now these two guys are connected, right? Now we pull B out of the PQ. Do I want to keep B? Where's B? It's over here. Do you want to keep it? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to keep C? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. Do I want to keep D? Yeah. yeah, I don't have that vertex. Basically, any vertex I don't have yet, I'll keep his edge. Okay. E, 5. Do I want to keep E? No. No, because I've already got a way to D. Can I just erase it? Uh-oh, it's all grouped together. Wait. Uh, uh, I could. Let's see. Uh, ungroup. Can I just click on the one edge? What if I just delete it? Oh yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> don't save the slide file, Marty. Don't save it. So I just I delete E. I don't keep E. I've got F. Do I want to keep F? Sure. Let's keep it because I don't have this guy yet. Uh, what about G? Do I want to keep G? No. I've already got those two vertexes. I can already reach them. I don't want that one. Uh, H. Do I want H? 
I think I do, because these guys over here are in a cluster, right? And these two are in a cluster, and these clumps can't reach each other yet. So let's keep H. Do I want I? That adds this new guy. Sure, I'll keep I. What about J? Do I want J? No. Um, K. This is a new vertex, so I'll keep him, right? L12 uh, is there. Yes or no? No, I already can reach those two. They're already connected. Um, M13, do I want that? I think no, because all my guys are connected into a giant clump right now, aren't they? Like, I, if, I, if it's a M, that's connecting this guy to this guy, right? And I can go all the way around here to get to the destination, so I don't need M. Okay, what about N? I don't want N because I can already reach those guys, right? Uh, o, 15, I don't need that. I can go all the way around. Uh, P is up here. I don't have this guy yet, so I will keep P. Um, Q is 17. I don't need that because I can already get there. And then we've got R. I don't think I need R because they're already all connected. So there, there's my minimum spanning tree, uh, PowerPoint style. <laughs> and, um, and we know just by the nature of the algorithm, we know it's going to be minimum weight because it looks at the cheaper edges first and all that stuff. So you guys have already basically implemented this algorithm, so I'm not spending that much time on it, right? But now we're kind of rethinking about it as being a graph problem. Now, a lot of the implementation challenges of this are still the same, keeping track of clusters, but you guys have thought about that a little bit before, so that shouldn't be too hard for you to do. But if I gave you like a basic graph object and I wanted you to do minimum spanning tree stuff, you could do that, right? So that's what Chris Gull's algorithm is. If I run that trailblazer program again, what it does with the uh, algorithm is if you say I want a random maze, it will run Kruskal on a connected maze. I don't know why it made it so wide, but uh, you want to see a huge maze? Let's do a random huge maze. Huge maze. It's, wow. Let's see some A star on this thing. Go, go, go. So anyway, your code that you're going to write a uh, Kruskal on these graphs, and you're going to remove the edges until you generate a random maze. And uh, eventually, it's taking a long time, because I think since it's a minimum spanning tree, I think that means there's actually only one way to get to the exit. <laughs> so that one way might be like really labyrinthine. It didn't stop. It's still working. It's, whoa. You cheated. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Plot twist <laughs> went off the map. Yeah, it's like that. What what is that dumb puzzle where it's like you get the the nine dots and you're supposed to connect them with four lines and you go right. What is it? And you go like uh, you go like, but somehow you end up over there like that. I did it wrong. <laughs> You, what do you do? You go like like that or something, and you get all of them or whatever, right? You connect them all with four lines. So, um, yeah, that's the same thing. So anyway, that's Chris Gall's algorithm. So for your assignment, I mean, you saw all these different types of graphs, like little maps, and you saw mazes, and you also saw those terrain elevation maps. Your code doesn't care about that at all. I just hand you a basic graph object that might correspond to any one of those three things, so you don't have to worry about which type of graph it is. And then I just ask you to run either depth first search, breadth first search, Dijkstra's algorithm, or A star on it. And you just got to implement those algorithms. We've already learned about them all. And then the fifth function you got to write is you got to generate a random maze, which is using Chris Call's algorithm. So that's what assignment seven is. And I think you guys should be able to handle it. Um, there's more I'm going to say about graphs after break on Monday, but we don't need the rest of it until assignment eight. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you guys have a really great Thanksgiving break. Go get some rest, see your family and friends, enjoy yourselves. And I'll see you in a week and a couple of days. Thanks.